Martha Laughlin is an ultrasound technologist at the Boston VA Medical Center. She was diagnosed with NF2 in 1987. When I was at Northeastern University, um, that was back in 1986, that I was a freshman in college. And I, everything was fine. And about towards the end of my freshman year, I started noticing I had trouble on the telephone talking with my right, on the, talking on my right ear. And around the same time, one of my good friends noticed I was having trouble hearing him correctly. And so then it was, I think the summer following that, all of a sudden, it didn't take very long, I lost almost all the hearing in my right ear. When we found out that our daughter had um, NF2, we were both devastated. My husband is a physician, and I think that that made it even more difficult because it had been such, we'd gone through such trouble to, to get a diagnosis. And I think as a father and a physician, he really felt very helpless. And when I found out I had NF, I was a little scared, and I was a little nervous and unsure. But I also didn't understand everything at the time because I was young, and nobody really knew that much about it then, so nobody could tell me. I mean, they stuck in it, but nobody could tell me this is what's going to happen, and this is what might, not, what might happen and what might not happen. When we found out that she had neurofibromatosis, my original reaction was to try and protect her from all of this. But after much discussing it, my husband and I, we decided that this was not fair to her. And really, almost from day one, she's become her own case manager, made the decisions on her own. Um, she's been through three horrific surgeries and has come out better for them, I think. Joe Lewin is a sports writer for the Trenton Times in New Jersey. He was diagnosed with NF1 as a young child. My parents were open and honest with me. My father has it, so I inherited it from him. So they were just very open with it and very, they weren't protective. They went the extra mile to find the doctors and the top specialists, from my, myself and my younger brother, to see as a result of the disease. As an adult, when I've been looking for a doctor, it's been a little hard finding doctors that know about NF. Because the doctor I went to as a child that was willing to keep up on it, retired. And so now that I'm on my own, it was just took me a few calls and a little bit of research to find a physician that knows what NF is and can, keeps up on it. I found this site on the World Wide Web that the national organization has that has lots of information for patient, new patients and old patients alike. And there are support group sites on Prodigy and America Online, both of which I have and I'm very active on. So it's just, like I said, every avenue I have or I know of that keeps me active in it, I follow. Andrew Idenden is 12 years old. Diagnosed with NF as an infant, his parents chose not to tell him about it until he was 10. And we had scoliosis testing at school. And, they, and the doctor there said that um, I had a scoliosis and they sent me to a doctor. So they gave me an x-ray there. And then they said that um, I, there was something there, but they couldn't identify it. So they sent me to another doctor. And at that doctor, I had the MRI. And then they said, mm, yes, I have neurofibromatosis. And it was on my back, so that's why my back was curving. Andrew's pediatrician knew nothing about NF at all. If it hadn't been for the special uh, neurosurgeon that we went to, we would have been pulling our hair out because as it turned out the information that we got from NF Foundation we made Xerox copies of it and gave it to Andrew's pediatrician because he didn't have any information at all and he just vaguely knew what it was. Anyway I had the back pains and I and it sort of scared me because I didn't know what it was, but 
when they told me I had neurofibromatosis, I, I got the idea that it was a tumor, so I wasn't that scared about it anymore, but I was scared about the operation. Andrew is still a very active child. Andrew um, partic participates, even though last year he was in seventh grade, he was in the high school marching band, and he kept up with the rigors of going to competitions and the long hours of practice. Um, it hasn't slowed him down. He has, he's a lot stronger about this than uh, his parents and grandparents. There are several astonishing things about neurofibromatosis which should give it the attention from the general population that it doesn't now have. First, NF is much more common than people realize. Secondly, it can hit any family regardless of gender or race or ethnic origin. Thirdly, these two genes causing NF1 and NF2 are implicated in the development of several of the most important and deadliest cancers in humans. And fourthly, there is a puzzling connection to learning disabilities. Learning disabilities occur about 10 to 15 percent in the general population, but they occur about 50 to 60 percent in the NF population. It all began with trying to find out where the genes are located, and that happened in 1987. The next was finding the two genes responsible for the two forms of NF. The next was identifying the proteins of the two um, genes produce. Without that, we could not do anything about manipulating the genes. Uh, we did that within, for NF1 within the first three weeks of the discovery. In NF2, it also occurred very shortly after finding the gene. This then has started scientists to think how they can def uh, correct the defects in these proteins. And that's where we are now. There is no cure at the present time nor is, any, is there any treatment other than for surgical removal of the growths, neurofibromas. We are, however, conducting experimental trials of drugs which we hope will prevent neurofibromas from growing. Well, we're focusing at the moment on methods of diagnosis, trying to identify the specific gene mutations responsible for NF in affected individuals. That should provide us diagnostic tests for either persons who have a family history of NF or who are suspected of having the disorder where it hasn't been proved yet.